Who here knows what Arweave is? No one. OK, fantastic. <laughs> so Arweave is a kind of permanent information storage system. The idea is that we've taken a blockchain and made it so that you can fit large amounts of data inside it, um, and miners are incentivized to store that data over extremely long periods of time. Um, from a technical perspective, it uses this, block, uh, this um, data structure that we call a block weave rather than a blockchain. The idea is that instead of including just the hash of the last block in the production of the next block, making sort of a cryptographic chain structure, you also include the entire contents of a randomly chosen previous block from the network in the production of a next, the next block. And this means that if you don't have access to that data, you can't generate the proof of work challenge required to take part in the production of the next block. So you're incentivized as a miner to store these old blocks. In fact, you're actually rewarded proportionately to the number of those old blocks you store. It creates a kind of incentive to store the old data in the network. So at the base layer, it's just a big on-chain data storage system uh, for preserving data over tens or hundreds of years. Um, on top of that, we also have a data distribution network, um, which essentially is kind of like optimistic tit for tat from Bitcoin, uh, sorry, BitTorrent, if you know it. The idea is, like, if you give me some data, I'm going to give you some data. And then occasionally, we just all give data to each other randomly and see what happens. And because of the way that the, the mechanism design in this works, it tends towards an equilibrium where we're all sharing data with one another all the time. Uh, yeah, so there's a sort of base layer for storage and then another layer on top for the distribution of data. So the entire system is built on top of HTTP and web technologies. The idea being that you can then take a transaction ID from the network and you can put it in your web browser and you can just say, hey, are we've node X? Um, yeah, please give me the data associated with this transaction. And that transaction will contain normally some kind of web page. And it gets rendered in your browser. So essentially what you have is a web built into a blockchain. Um, and this works very well as a kind of uh, hosting environment for decentralized web applications, and particularly web application UIs. The idea is um, if you are building a smart contract, say, you typically need a UI to go in front of it. But the problem is if you put that UI on some kind of centralized service, at some point, it's going to be lost and forgotten. That doesn't work very well. You've still got this smart contract in the background. So let's think about CryptoKitties, say. You've still got your CryptoKitty, but if there's no UI in the front end to look at, then, then your CryptoKitties are really just numbers. So the idea is you put the UI for this system, um, yeah onto Arweave, where it's permanent, and then it's just as permanent as a smart contract. And the two things sort of live together. And so the user has access to the uh, application for much, much longer. OK, that's kind of the base level of my presentation that we couldn't get working on this projector. Um, yeah, let's just try deploying an Arweave page. So the first thing you should do is go to, in fact, I will look so I can do it as we, as we go as well. <laughs> yeah, all right. So. If you go to docs.arweave.org and click developer docs, then this is everything you need to get started building um, web applications on top of Arweave. In fact, it's really, really super simple. There's basically nothing to it. So if we click uh, Arweave um, uh, deploy user guide, it takes you uh, to the page that's got all the information you need to build web applications. Um, yeah, if we click Arweave Deploy User Guide, Arweave Deploy is a really simple CLI tool that just allows you to take a HTML page or some other file and then dump it into the blockchain, essentially. Um, yeah, so the first thing you need to do on a terminal is uh, npm install dash g Arweave dash deploy. Install the deploy tool. It's just this. Um, yeah, and let's just give it a try. So. Uh, make a directory. Is that? I'm assuming that's too small. Cool. Okay. Uh, so let's just make a simple web page. Wow. The color of the terminal changes the room color. OK, so we'll just make a um, super simple hello world. Hello, Dapcon. Page 
And of course, this can basically be uh, any kind of HTML you like. And so if we have the deploy tool installed, we can just say rweave and then uh, a command like balance, for example, and it'll show me what my balance is. Um, if you haven't set it up yet, you can just say, uh, yeah, you can load a key file, which we'll get to in a second. So the critical thing is you just want to say rweave deploy and then the name of the file. You hit that and decrypt your key file if you need to. And it'll tell you, OK, I'm going to make a transaction called TSPN, blah, 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 blah. It's going to cost basically nothing. Um, it's going to be deployed with these tags, and it's going to go from this wallet. Yeah, and you just say confirm. And there we go. Now that's going to the Rweave. And if we go to this address, um, once it's confirmed, so literally written into a block, uh, yeah, we will be served back the HTML page that we just created. So one of the interesting things about Arweave that's kind of different from other data storage systems like IPFS or DAT or SIA, for example, is that um, we have a slow write, fast read approach. So you, you're always kind of making trade-offs here. And normally, the trade-off is that you can write data into the system very, very quickly. But to read that data out, or more specifically, to find that data is very slow. We take the opposite approach, because we think that um, Web developers, when they deploy applications, they don't mind waiting a small amount of time to do so if users can then access those applications in like sub-second or sub-200 millisecond times. Um, so you'll find that once the thing is actually onto the system, you can always access it extremely quickly, uh, and your users can access it extremely quickly. But getting it there you know, takes a little bit of time. Um, yeah, OK, so while that's confirming, um, we'll get wallets, I guess. So who has installed the deployment tool? All right, a few people. Well, if you're following along, um, the next thing you need to do is get some tokens. The easiest way to do this, of course, you can, you can mine them. Um, you could, we could also just send them to you. Uh, and yeah, you could buy some. But the easiest way is if you just go to tokens.arweave.org, which has this sort of embarrassingly centralized continue with Google button, which allows you to uh, claim a free token. And we, we use Google because it's actually reasonably good civil resistance for identities. It's kind of hard to forge like hundreds of thousands of Google accounts. Um, yeah, so if you just click this, you have to train Google's uh, neural network for a moment. <laughs> and in fact, I've already got one, so it's not going to work for me. Um, yeah, but if you do that, then you'll get sent an email. You just press the button. Uh, and you can download a key file, and then you can use it to deploy pages. And as you saw before, the pages are extremely cheap to deploy, so it doesn't take very long. This is really the core of what Arweave does. And when, when, when it's confirmed, it looks a little bit like this. So Weave Watcher is a decentralized web application that someone made that just looks backwards through the block weave and sees what's stored inside it. It's really simple. It's just a HTML page. And I think this cost. Um, well, I could find out, actually. So we take the transaction ID. If we look on view block, the block explorer we have. See, this was submitted four months ago. And it cost 0 .0000, 0 0.0007R, which is Yeah, um, a tenth of a cent. And the cool thing about that is now that page is deployed, it will just always work there. And there's economic incentives and mechanisms in the background that make it so that it's profitable for miners to store that data essentially indefinitely. That is actually kind of an interesting mechanism, which we may as well get into while you guys are getting wallets and things. Um, yeah, so when you put a piece of information into Arweave, you pay up front for 200 to 300 years worth of storage. And those tokens get put aside into a pool. Um, and over time, as the cost of storage declines, the purchasing power of those tokens that you've already put aside increases. Essentially, this means by the end of like year five or year 10, uh, you have tens of thousands of years worth of storage pricing already like, backed up. And as long as this rate exceeds around, yeah, the storage de cost decline rate exceeds 0.3 to 0.5%, um, just never stops. It's basically like an endowment. 
So if you had a student endowment, you would say, okay, I'm putting aside $10 million, and then I can take away like, you know, $9,000 every year indefinitely to pay for somebody's tuition fees. Same kind of principle except with storage, and we get interest from the declining cost of storage rather than the interest you would normally get on a financial instrument. Yeah, so does anyone have any questions? It will eventually live in some kind of physical machine that somebody owns and somebody has to pay for. Yeah. Who pays for it? The node owner? Um, well, the node owner is expending value right to store it. That's yeah. true. But they're being paid by the network. And it's not like one person is assigned the storage of the file. Um, it's actually more that there's an incentive for everyone to try and store the file. In fact, they're really competing to store the file in the same way you would compete in Bitcoin um, to have the largest amount of hashing power. Or really, you're competing in a race to find a candidate block first. I see. How is it different from IPFS then? Sure. Is I mean, layer on top? Yeah. yeah, it has the incentive layer on top. It uses different kind of routing. Uh, IPFS is really just a way of saying, I have a content address. I would like to find it somewhere in the network. It's just a big DHT. We actually don't even have a DHT. Um, yeah, the way that we look at it is finding content in a decentralized network, like a really big one, is an extraordinarily difficult problem. Like, people have been trying to do it since the 1980s. Just no solution so far scales. With IPFS, like, we built an extension that takes Arweave data and makes it available in IPFS. So you can also take IPFS data, put it into Arweave, and then make it available in IPFS. The idea being that we can apply the incentive layer that we have to data in IPFS. And so this means we played around with IPFS a lot. Um, and we found that, like, on average, the data access time is seven minutes on a public IPFS network. It's, it's pretty crazy. So, and this is not fantastically surprising. Like, people have been looking at this problem for a very long time. And Kademlia, which was built in, like, 1998, for the Nutella project is the best attempt we have at addressing content in this manner in a decentralized network. So we take a different approach, which is to say, OK, well, if finding data, like the needle in the haystack, is hard, then why not flip it? Why not make it so that the data is almost everywhere as a result of incentives, so that finding that data is extremely easy? And that's essentially what we do with this proof of access mechanism, which is enforced by the uh, block weave structure. Because if you want to take part in mining, you have to replicate that data. And as a consequence, it's just way, way easier to find it. So in the network at the moment, if you go to, uh, yeah, let's have a look. I think we've got like 500 nodes or something. And the average replication rate will be, yeah, the average replication rate for, say, this piece of, ah, in fact, looks like our, um, our page has deployed. So we go to, oh, we've got net. And sure enough, hello.com. Um, yeah, our page is now mirrored on 500 different nodes. So if you go to a random node in the network and you say, hey, can you give me you know, whatever this transaction ID is, there's a very, very high likelihood that they're actually going to have access to it. And this means that you can, yeah, you can have decentralized web application experiences that don't suck for the user. Because at the moment, the alternative is that like, they go to a page. I mean, we could try. Let's see if we get lucky. I think IPFS.io is stored on IPFS. And like it's super slow. Um, yeah. It's, I think, the, the best way of doing this that actually works for users. So it's pretty simple. You just put it, your uh, smart contract, that kind of system, onto Ethereum or what have you. And then you just build a normal web UI, and you package it up. And then you deploy it on Arweave, and it just works. Yeah. But what about comparison with Swarm? Because Swarm also uses Kanamlia, and Swarm also uses in incentive mechanism for storing data, accessing data, so more and the same. Yeah, so Swarm isn't live yet, so we can't really see what the performance is like in the live network, but it will presumably be around the same as IPFS or DAT or really, or Nutella or Napster or any, or Kazaa or any of the other, or Lime, what was that one called? LimeWire, I think it was. Like any of the other P2P of file sharing systems that have existed previously, it'll have the same kind of performance mechanics because it's based on the same algorithm. Um, and in terms of the incentives, it's cool that Swarm are building incentives into their system. I'm really interested to see where this goes, actually, because the reason that Filecoin didn't use Ethereum, as far as I can tell, for their, um, yeah, the data storage incentives in the network was because 
if you have, you're, you're trying to build a decentralized web, right? So it's going to have billions or trillions of files. If each of those files has a contract associated with it, how are you going to get Ethereum to mediate that? And the Filecoin solution to this, as far as we can tell from their GitHub repos, is basically to say, OK, well, you just don't adjudicate all of the contracts. So if I put a piece of information into Filecoin, it's then my responsibility to check with the miners that have been um, tasked with storing my file that they are actually storing my file. And we don't do this at a network enforced level because it just wouldn't scale. So I'm really interested to see how Swarm solved that problem. Then another question is then, basically you say that you benefit an NTFS. Uh, Swarm is not ready yet. So how you manage to overperform you know, them? <laughs> well, I think we take a very different approach. And we're not really trying to do the same thing. So I think there's like decentralized storage networks in general that are looking at maybe really, really large files. That's not something you want to do on uh, Arweave. Yeah, I guess we're just making different trade-offs. So they're looking at like, sure. Can you build a database? Can you build an interface? Database. Uh, yeah, you actually have lots of applications that do database-like things. Um, so, I can't remember the address now, but there's a, a decentralized Cora system on top of Arweave. There's this thing we call RQL, which is a way of, so um, every transaction in the network, if we look back at this, can have tags. And there's a, a database on each of the nodes that just keeps track of the tags of each of the um, transactions it's aware of. So yeah, you can essentially query that database and find all of the transactions that are associated with, for example, the application type you're looking at. Um, we actually think in the longer term, so this is, this is not a replicated database, it's just on each node. So you're talking to the node about its view of what it knows of the network. We think in the longer term, other decentralized database projects will come along and you'll essentially submit your data to Arweave and then you'll submit a record to this decentralized, um, decentralized and globally consistent database that says, hey, I've got this Arweave piece of data that's associated with these kinds of records, or you know, these tags, and then you can query that, and it gives you a globally like, uh, consistent view. But RQL works really well for now, so you can actually build like, interactive decentralized web applications with it. All right, any other questions? Okay, thank you for this very weird and dark workshop this morning. I hope you all have a great day. <laughs> Oh, well, go for it. <laughs> and how did, did you ever do a comparison against IPFS on Cloudflare? Because I do, I mean, of course, as you have just a decentralized IPFS network, there's going to be slow nodes, and I, I can see how it can take a long time. But if you take somebody like Cloudflare, whose business it is to have a global, they live at the edge, of, and if they put IPFS on the edge, then I would imagine that that is quite fast and quite hard to compete with. Well, it I mean, centralized in a way, so it's, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, if you just make a, a replica of the entire web and you put it in a data center and then you access it, sure, it's totally going to be fast. That's true. Um, but realistically, most of the data isn't even replicated inside it. I don't know why, but like the Cloudflare uh, IPFS cache isn't really that large, which is surprising. You'd think they would just basically say, well, let's just store it all. And part of the problem there is like, the, you can't find it. You can only find a piece of data in IPFS if you know what it's called. So, for example, we're working with this group called Everypedia. It's one of the Wikipedia founders spun off to make this uh, sort of Wikipedia that was more decentralized and less kind of like, um, less control over what articles should or should not be written, essentially. So they have all of Wikipedia in there to start with. And we started saying, okay, well, we can grab the data from IPFS and we can put it in Arweave and then we you know, do this thing I was saying where we also expose it over IPFS again. And what we were finding was that like, even though Cloudflare could store copies of this, and we were accessing through the Cloudflare database, uh, sorry, the Cloudflare endpoint to try and make it fast, um, even if they could store copies of it, they weren't. And so it was still taking like seven minutes. And sometimes when you go to ipfs.io even, which I'm pretty sure uses the Cloudflare, um, yeah, the Cloudflare gateway, sometimes it's forgotten it. It's just dropped it from the cache, and then you have to actually go out into the real IPFS network and, and try and find it. What we're seeing more and more is that people are using IPFS in local systems, where it works really, really well. It's great for that. 
Um, so you have like a small local area network with a whole bunch of computers and you want to just like share some files around. IPFS is fantastic for that. It, it does the DHT that works really, really well. It just doesn't appear to scale to global sizes. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> Go for it. One last one. So yeah. Technically, um, I think I understand it now, but given that it's a network, you'll only get utility from it if you have enough participants, a chicken and egg problem of every network, basically, right? So what's your um, path to adoption? Let's say, are you, are you first targeting, I don't know, business users or large scale, or are you trying to go acquire all the crypto users to put their files on there? What's your strategy to so get a couple people of to use it on a large scale? Yeah, a couple of different things. Like things like this, where we can talk to crypto users that are building dApps and they need somewhere to store their UI. It's a really simple and obvious use case, and it's fast, and there isn't really an alternative right now which is usable. You know, like you can put your interface on IPFS, but from the people that we've seen and spoken to, they do this in the background, but then really they're just using AWS to serve it because, you know, you can't have the user waiting seven minutes to get access to the web page. Just they're going to go and do something else. Um, and on top of that, the reason we got into this was to make a censorship archive of history. The idea being that, you know, if you're familiar with 1984, the idea of the memory hole, right, that you can essentially, if nobody remembers what happens in the past, it's impossible to really tell. And if you don't have records of it, it's sort of in the ether. And that means it can be manipulated, and that changes the way we think about the future. It also changes the way we make decisions in society. So we got into this to, to build a solution to the memory hole. Um, yeah, and now one of the paths to adoption we see is just making sure that the tools are in the places, like for example in Hong Kong right now, where bits of history might be censored, and then making sure that people are aware that now there's an immutable record of that bit of history. Um, but you know, we're experimenting. We'll see how it goes. Thank you. Thanks.